thank you for the opportunity and to all of you for being here today. So I don't know if it's just a 10 o'clock time slot works for you or you're really interested in the library. But um, We today, uh, each of the faculty librarians, just going to take a few moments to go through one of the new resources that we've added within the last year. And uh, many that you may not, a couple you may not know about, uh, but to refresh your mind on maybe one or two that you may know about. Uh, so we'll turn on that and we'll get started. Uh, the order that we'll go in is uh, Lori Mattis will talk with you. Uh, she is the public services librarian. Uh, Amy Mercer, who is the serials tech services librarian. Diet Ward, who is electronic resources and instruction librarian and Julie Birchfield, who is our library coordinator for distance learning and works specifically with DAL. So, uh, so again, thank you for being here today. I have such a, you know, we're the most model stereotypical librarians you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> All right. We were laughing because we just, by coincidence, were sitting in the order in which we're going. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought they were laughing at you. Well, that's normally <laughs> what it is. So. All right. Asked to sit us. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Lori will talk to you about uh, the new JSTOR ebook collection. It's a, a new pilot program that we're, we have access to through the Appalachian College Association. Amy will talk to you about the Canopy streaming videos collection that we have. Diet will talk with you about how to create reading lists in Moodle and also the interlibrary loan link that makes requesting interlibrary loan easier for you now. And Julie will talk uh, and kind of lead a discussion uh, and we'll all pitch in with that about creating relevant subject guides for your disciplines. And the, we're about to transition to a new form of subject guides and we want your input and we want to collaborate with you about what's going to be most effective for you and your students. So, a couple of things just to frame the discussion. Uh, how often, you, I'm not asking you to answer these, you answer these internally, how often do you use Lee's Library resources yourself? How often do you recommend the Lee's Library resources to your students? And are there new library resources for which you feel you need assistance when using? Uh, are there something that you think I might use this more if I knew a little bit better, felt more comfortable in using it? And then, do you instruct your students to use Lee's library resources? And do you specifically mention this in either the course syllabus or the assignments that you have to direct students to the library and the resources there? Uh, so hopefully today, you'll learn something about the new resources that will assist you and your students this semester and in semesters to come. One thing I want to let you know before I turn the rest of the program over to the librarians is the off-campus access for this semester. We get a lot of questions for this, uh, so make sure that you know this and feel, please communicate this with your students. The username this semester is spring2016 and the password is focus. And now I will turn the rest of the presentation over to uh, Lori who will come. JSTOR, as you know, is one of the databases we provide uh, to Lee's uh, campus and it's a very popular database. It's probably the second or third most popular database after Academic Search Complete. And uh, ACA every year set aside uh, funds to buy ebook collections. And usually we purchase like Palgrave or uh, GVRL. Uh, but this year we decided we would try this uh, pilot with JSTOR. And it's a DDA, which is Demand Driven Acquisitions. Um, and so I'm going to introduce it. What this allows us is uh, unlimited access to over 30,000 titles that JSTOR provides. And it grows. Uh, they're always updating the titles. But the difference is, instead of outright purchasing all of these titles, it's per they're purchased by demand. So if we get, and this is over the whole consortium of ACA libraries, so it's not just Lee's. Um, if we get 125 chapter views of a book, ebook, or 85 chapter downloads of a ebook, the ACA purchases that book automatically. Okay. Uh, the good thing is we have perpetual access to all of the titles that we've purchased. So far, we started this in September. 
so far we've purchased one title, which I will share later. <laughs> you all will want to run out and read it when I tell you it. Let me just say that. Uh, so, and titles are added to the platform uh, weekly. Uh, as of September, uh, we had over 31,000 titles. The list price of those titles is over, you know, close to $3 million. The price range uh, of those titles are from $1.95 to $900. And the copyright range is from 1867 to 2016. And so, as you know, JSTOR is really good about having really old, you know, material from the 1800s. And, uh, so it's a really robust collection. Uh, these are the subjects that it covers. Uh, I am a history person, so I'm like, yay, history. Very exciting. Uh, but it, co you know, it covers a wide uh, range of subject material. And the publishers, I think you'll all be excited. They're, you know, academic, uh, and they're quite uh, diverse. And Amy's very excited because Kentucky is represented. So... Okay, and we cover a diverse set of languages, um, which is very good because especially with our programs in Simbifka and Semisud, uh, which Julie uh, is our uh, distance learning librarian, so she's very excited about the Spanish titles that we now have. Um, so this should be really good for uh, our distance students. Okay. This is just from the, uh, I just wanted to, <laughs> yes, you see what the title is that we published, I mean that we brought, the Encyclopedia of Historic and Endangered Livestock and Poultry Breeds. Our school did not purchase that. I don't know which school did, but it wasn't Lee. But we do now have it forever. So, you know, anytime you want to go read it, it's there for you. Um, but so you see, it's you know, at first when we first proposed this, my view was, you know, oh my goodness, we're gonna be buying books left and right. But we don't, you know, it's a real it's a I think it's a good level so that if it's something that is really popular beyond the poultry, uh, you know, then it'll trigger a purchase. So I think it's a good uh balance. All right. From August to December, the usage you can see across the whole ACA. And so the total purchase cost of that one book, I believe, is over $2,528. You know, $2, but considering the uh, downloads and views, it's only 31, it was 31 cents per view. Okay? All right. Lee's uses, usage from August to December. We had 859 unique books viewed, uh, 1,559 views, 686 downloads, and then you see the combination. Uh, but remember, for us to purchase it, it has to be 185 views, I mean 125 views or 85 downloads, not a combination. It's either or. Okay. And here are the top five Lee titles that have been viewed which the first one is not uh, surprising, I don't think. And so we really haven't gotten anywhere close to purchasing uh, if you look at just the views or downloads. So we have still, so if there's a book you want us to purchase, get to downloading, get to viewing. I would say, and I would encourage you to do that, if you find a book on there that you think is going to be helpful for us to have that you would use or you'd want your students to look at. Encourage your students to look at the book title because if we get, if we make the purchase, even if this pilot, if we're not with this anymore, as long as we would have JSTOR, we would still own the title, uh, have access to that title. So if it's, search the collection. If there's something you think we need to have, then work on getting your students to help you to, uh, to get enough downloads to have mm -hmm. a purchase the book. And it is searchable, you know, you can go onto the library website and go to JSTOR itself and look for a uh, search for books, and it's also searchable through Discovery. Well, or, it's about to be. Okay, about we're to be. We're working on, because we don't own them yet, we're having some difficulty making sure that they're discoverable through Discovery Service, searchable through Discovery Service, but we're working on it. Once the titles are purchased, 
they absolutely will be in Discovery Service. But anytime you do just a JSTOR search, you're automatically searching through their ebook collection as well. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what Discovery Service is, that's the main search box when you go to the library's homepage that searches most of all of the resources with Assembly Service. All right. And when we t you'll hear us say Discovery Service, that's this search box here. Okay. But if you wanted to go just to JSTOR, And see, and now, books. So, so when you search, you'll see uh, you know, various titles come up, and you'll see books. And you can either, and it'll show you download, or just view. And you can choose whichever way you want to. And they do break it up into chapters, so you can. Um, and when you do an advanced search, you can even narrow it down. So you yes. Can just after oh, the actually, search. yes. Yeah. That's what I did this morning. Maybe. And so you can just check off books if you just want to look at books. All right. Do you have any questions? Do you want me to look up the poultry book? No. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. I am done. Lori? Yes. Uh, what does the discovery box not search? Or is uh, it have to search something else? It, Westlaw, Campus Research, and... Um, I want to say religious and theological journals online. There's there's three or four. I think there's three now, and they're actually when you're in Discovery Service, they're over on the right hand side with hot links to them because they aren't searchable in that database. So in that search engine, we wanted to make sure you still had access to them, you know, right yeah, on the same page. So they're listed right there. I don't know. I don't think it's up here. I think we have to actually search for something. We do. Do you have anything? Search poultry. for poultry. <laughs> poultry, there we go. Seems to be popular with our people. <laughs> okay, so this should be oh, right here. Here we go. Yeah, Westlaw, ICPSR. And ICPSR is a, it's statistics and data, so it just doesn't search well in here. Um, and then the theological journals online. So those are the three that we just, they just don't have contract negotiations or they're not really searchable through this same platform. And that's why they're not, uh, they're not in there yet. But those are the only three. So all of the rest of our content is in Discovery Service. All right. Okay, I'm gonna talk to you now about our streaming uh, video service, which it's brand new. Also, I guess we would consider a pilot program um, that we worked with ACA to uh, set this up. And, you know, we've wanted to for a long time have some kind of streaming service available. Um, obviously, they're expensive. And, and you know, so I'm going to explain kind of how this one works. Um, the name is Canopy, and there's the icon. So maybe that will help you to remember uh, the name. But it's patron-driven access, which is, you know, kind of goes along with what Lori was saying about the books. Uh, however, it works a little bit different, but um, it features about 14,000 films, and so these are award-winning documentaries, um, training films. Some are actually, you know, feature films, uh, so like for film studies, some of the earlier uh, films that would be looked at in film studies are, are made available there as well. Um, <clears throat> so the patron-driven access in this case works um, based on views, and what Canopy considers a view is um, if the video is watched for 30 seconds or more. So we are asking people to be mindful of this, um, and I'll show you once we get into the database that um, it has a, a good synopsis for each uh, film, and, and we'll tell about it and, uh, you know, gives reviews and so forth. So, so that will be helpful, um, and so just if you're mindful of that, that's great. After a f the fourth view of a particular film, so going into the fifth view, then we would purchase that film for a year. Um, and we have set a cap on how much we would spend per year. So we're just going to see how it goes. And, um, and so we don't, you know, our cap doesn't allow for uh, viewing of a huge number of films. But again, we just do encourage you to get in there and see what would be uh, beneficial to your disciplines. And so, um, you know, you can search by title, obviously, if you know of a particular documentary, you want to see if it's in there. You can search by title. Uh, you can do keyword searching. 
And then I'll also show you how to browse by discipline. And that will be interesting for you, I would think, to see what's going to be in there for your discipline. Um, you can create your own watch lists. Um, you know, create your own account. Another thing that can be very helpful uh, for classes, whether you want to show clips in class or you want to embed them into Moodle, because it does allow you to embed a clip. Um, you know, it does allow you to, to create clips based on a, a certain um, length of time. You can post comments on videos and even send questions to filmmakers. So, uh, how is it accessed? The way you want to think of this is think of it as a database. I mean, this is, you know, one of our databases that Diet set up. Um, so you think of it as a database that will allow you to, to go in and, and uh, find out how to access that. So let's do that. So when you're at the library homepage, you'll just find the database link. Um, it is listed in a number of the categories uh, if there is content based on a certain discipline. So it's not uh, going to be found in each subject heading, but it will be found in some, and you can find it alphabetically. <coughs> so it's canopy with a K. <laughs> yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? But canopy being that they do uh, strive to create content and provide content in a lot of different areas. So when you go to the main page, you're always going to see um, what's new to Canopy, what's buzzworthy, etc. Obviously, some of the uh, categories that it's going to feature on its home page are going to change from time to time. So you can scroll down and just kind of see what's being featured and highlighted. Up here uh, is where you would do a title search or a keyword search, and after you do those searches, then there are other limiters that you can uh, click on to, uh, if you wanted just more recent content and so on. So let's go ahead and just go to the browse area. So then when you hover over the browse subject area, then you're gonna get very broad categories. So I would think most of you would see something that would apply to uh, your fields. So, and then you, if you can hover over um, a broad subject, then you can see the other subdivisions here. So we've got film and popular, uh, the arts, everything down to visual art, um, business, and it has also business case studies. Um, you know, I've not gone in and actually looked at those, but I don't know if those would be something that would be of interest to the business department, uh, <coughs> education content, and then you can see subdivisions for global studies, languages, health, and we do have nursing. We've got some nursing folks in here. Um, media and communications, sciences, uh, a lot in the social sciences, and actually. And there are religion and philosophy. Yes, yes. Uh, social sciences. Came up yesterday when we were yes. discussing this. <laughs> well, I'm having trouble getting that to hover correctly. But if you go on down, there actually is religion and philosophy is on down there. It's not showing up on this screen. Um, so we'll just just delve into one of these areas. If we go to social sciences, um, we could do anthropology, for instance. Okay, and then you're gonna get some other uh, headings here, what's most popular in sociology, and so on. I mean, excuse me, anthropology. And then we'll come on down. Uh, Sometimes these limiters will show up right away, but I think in this case, because there are so many videos in this area, then, you know, the videos are highlighted first. But if you come on down, you'll see how many videos there are. Um, there are over a thousand in this area. And then you can do some further subdividing um, by suppliers, filmmakers, and so on. Uh, languages as well. So there are some most categories have some Spanish language videos, um, and then other languages are featured at times. Um, you can also limit by what has captions and what does not, and then years of production. So that could be, uh, you know, if you're looking at a discipline where recent content is important, then that's a great way to narrow down to just more recent years of production. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Now, you can create your own account. It's just as simple as, you know, creating an EBSCO account or, you know, any kind of uh, free account. It doesn't require a lot of information. And when you do that, then you will be able to uh, create clips 
if that's something that you're interested in or playlist. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in. made me do kind of a complex password. I don't think I really did that on my own, so let me see if I can get that in there. This, this uh, password is not our universal password. No, now that's a great question, right? Now, if you were trying to access this from off campus, just as you would with any of our other databases, then you would need that that general off-campus username and, and password. But this is based on an account that I created. But any of you can create an account. You know, if you're on an on-campus computer, you go to this database, then you just want to, where it says sign in, then you would just click sign up, and then you could create your own account. Just like with your EBSCOhost account, though, we ask that you do use your Lee University email address so that if we have to be able to go back to the vendor and get your password for you in case you lose it, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easier for us to do that if mm -hmm. we're all using the same email, so not your Hotmail or... Is there a charge for creating your own account? No. It's just a free account. And again, the reason you would want to do that is if you want to save something to a playlist, and definitely if you want to, to save clips that you could later go and show to a class or uh, embed in, uh, in Moodle and so on. Okay, so I have an account. The dashboard would just kind of show all of my overall activity. And then... Um, we have playlists and then watch lists. Watch list is really just showing the history of anything that you viewed. Even if you only viewed a portion of a video, that's going to just keep a history of what you've viewed. But um, for instance, um, if you were interested in a particular video and wanted to, oh, let's just double click there. We won't watch it, but if uh, let's say that you had gone in, you watched this video, you thought it was very uh, helpful. You know, it may be something that you wanted to show in full to a class, but if you wanted to only show a particular clip, then what you would want to do is, you know, once you figure out the clip that you want, you would just want to put down the, uh, the times, uh, the start time and the finish time, uh, and then create your clip. So if you go here to do that, it will just ask you to put a name in, and when you hit create, then it's going to send that video to your playlist. And then once you have a video in the playlists, then you can uh, create that clip. So, like for instance, I created one here. Now, this is something that um, we talked about yesterday and wanted to make sure that this, this is something that we can do. Um, you know, obviously, going back to the patron-driven access point, um, you know, after four views, then of course we would purchase that. And, and Certainly we want you to use this, but if it's possible to get the most usage without it counting, you know, as a view, you know, we want to be mindful of that. And, you know, you may want a clip that, you know, you know, in order to be useful, a clip may need to be a certain length. But if there's a short clip, um, if you create a clip, and I did yesterday, that's only 25 seconds long, then that would not constitute a usage and would not go towards a charge. So that's just something to be mindful of. Um, if I click edit, so if I had just added something to the playlist, then I would just click edit, I'll go to edit again, and then you'll see where you can capture that, that range for the clip, and then, and then save it. And then once you save that under your account, then that will uh, be in your playlist, and I'll show you one more thing. And that is that, you know, now that I have a clip, if I want to share that, you know, I can share the URL or I can embed that. Okay. So that's the embed code that you would use in Moodle. Mm -hmm. You just copy and paste that. Why don't you show them the synopsis? How oh, do the synopsis? yes, I didn't do that. Um, if you try to create a video less than 30 seconds long, you do get this message that says that it's not a long enough video, but it is, and it will actually let you still create it. Right, it said like invalid clip length, but it would still allow us to create that. So. Okay, so... Uh, Yes, Lewis emphasized the... Invalid use case? Right, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we like free. Yeah, as I, we had mentioned before, you know, you can look at a synopsis for any film. Um, and I've noticed that some of them, particularly if they are an award-winning film, 
It will have awards listed that are associated with that documentary. It will also have um, some reviews too. So now this one, it, in this case, it did not, but, but you do have a synopsis that you can, can read. So basically under each video, you know, you don't even have to, to view it. You can just quickly go to synopsis and find out about it. And this mm -hmm. does include licensing so that you can show this in a class if you wanted to as well. It's completely, it's been cleared for you to put on Moodle, put in your clips so that you don't have to worry about copyright issues. Right. Jim, did you have a question? You've been in other format, online formats that don't have a text and maybe online uh, format. Can I embed some other online formats? Yeah, I would think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, right. No. no. It's 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 regular generic embed. Generic. Right. Yeah. All right. Anything <coughs> else? Questions? Comments? Okay. I will turn it over to the next person. Um, I am gonna just show you a couple of things that I know that we've sent out emails about these over the last semester, but I also know that you guys get eight thousand emails a day, like I do, um, and so it's possible that maybe you didn't uh, see these emails. No judgment. All of God's children. <laughs> Uh, but I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of things that are going on in the library that should help make your lives easier. Okay, so we mentioned before about our lovely giant search engine here, and I know that Lori already did a search on poultry, uh, but we'll go back and do that one again. Oh, look at that, poultry. It's a popular term for us now. <laughs> um, and as we mentioned before, of course, this is where uh, most of our information, our uh, e-journals, our e-books, and our actual paper books and journals live. Uh, so this is our set of results. I'm sure you're all familiar with this now. But one of the things that we um, did add this uh, last semester is th this new interlibrary loan link. So this has been really useful for your students. Um, as we do, of course, have a number of times where they will come across items that we have um, as an abstract and an index, um, they're indexed and they're in an abstract, but we don't have the full text. And they can sometimes find that very frustrating, but now they are all embracing ILL, yay! Uh, so they can click on any item that we do not have in full text, this link will appear below the item. And when they open it, it just asks for their personal information, not too personal, but it generates all of the information about the title. So they don't have to worry about that. Uh, so we're actually getting much more uh, exact and precise ILL requests, which is also great. <laughs> and then they just submit at the bottom. So of course you are welcome to use this too. Um, if you find something not through our discovery service, but you want to do an interlibrary loan, of course the old interlibrary loan link is still here. We didn't take it away <clears throat> and you would <clears throat> just as you had done before, it still designate what kind of item you're looking for. You fill out the information about the item. And remember, this is where you have to do that last name, comma, space, first name. And then you do your barcode or password is LEE00, and then your employee number. And even if your employee number begins with some zeros, you still include all of those. So, um, so you still have the old way to also do interlibrary loan and, you know, there's no right or wrong here, no judgment, all God's children. If you want to go the old school way, that's just fine. So any questions about that? It's just one more way to sort of um, make materials more accessible for you and for the students. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I have been asked to show you today is uh, our, new, um, our new widget for Moodle. Uh, so we um, spent a good portion of this last semester getting this widget put together uh, for Moodle. So this is my Moodle account. And what we have created is a, um, a widget that's really easy to add. So in my course here, you'll notice that it's right here. This is my reading list. So um, it's very easy to add. And what it does is it allows you to search through for items through the library. So any e-resources that we have, and then you can just add them straight into Moodle in a reading list. And you can make notes, and you don't have to worry about um, links disappearing or um, sort of timing out. It will create all the permanent links for you. You can also add websites, so you can add other content from other places. When you look at this without having editing on, then the widget looks like this. So right now I could do a search for poultry, because that's our theme today. And then it's going to pull up some resources from the library. 
and you can just click and add anything to the reading list. It's just that simple. So it's very easy to use. It's also really easy to set up. So when I turn my editing on, if you just go to add resource and under the general tools, you would type in whatever you want to call the reading list. It doesn't matter. You can name it whatever you would like. And then you want to grab this particular tool. This is Discovery Service Curriculum Builder. Uh, and then you just save it and you return to the course and then it's set up. So it's very easy to set up. You can put it in your main you know, course material block here. Or if you want to, you can add it to individual units. So it's up to you. It's your preference. Um, when you look at the current reading list, you'll notice that I have a number of different things. So here is um, an ebook. Here are some different websites that I've, you know, I've found and I want the students to go and look at them. But you can also add notes. So at any time that you want, as you're adding this content, you can add notes to the students. Please read chapter 12. Um, please note this. Um, you can also rank them. So as you continue to add material, you can sort of decide, I want this towards the bottom, I want this towards the top. So it doesn't have to be in any sort of order other than the order that you want. So it's a really helpful tool, and it will take you about two minutes to set it up. And like all of the other widgets, this one is sort of transferable. So next semester, you can grab your reading list from this last semester and move it over. And then just change whatever content you want. Okay. Questions? Comments? Um, if you have more questions about either of these, um, at the library's page, you probably already knew this, but we have a, um, a subject guide for you right here called Faculty Resources. And we've created some little videos for you on things like interlibrary loan and how to create that reading list for Moodle. Um, it also has your re request form, so if you want to order some books and then just other information that you might need. And anytime that we have other new cool things, we'll promise that we'll post them up here too. So this will just be a one-stop shopping page for you if you have questions. Okay, all right, we're gonna be talking about LibGuides, and if you are not familiar with the library's LibGuides, wondering what those are, um, LibGuides <laughs> is actually a content management system that we use, um, this was the um, definition from SpringShare, the provider, to curate knowledge and share information by creating online guides on any topic, subject, course, or any process on anything. And that's really what it allows us to do, create like these little web pages about anything that, that we feel is needed. And so what content is included on our LibGuides? We have obviously library specific info, the basic stuff, what are your hours, how do we contact you, who works there, how can we get a hold of them, what do they do, and how many books can I check out. So all of the basic information is obviously there. We also have library instruction, and we'll talk about that more later, but we have lots of instructional videos that you can encourage your students to use. And then we have discipline specific info, so we have a nursing page that's specifically for our nursing students, and we have those for different disciplines also. And then we also have subject specific info that um, is about a specific subject that maybe your class might be talking about, and we can create a guide for that that we've done in the past, and we'll look at some of that in a little bit. So do people actually use the library LibGuides? Yes, and last year we had almost 30,000 views of our LibGuides. So we definitely have people using them, but we would definitely like to see more usage because there's a lot of useful information that's easy for our students to find, I think, if they realize that it was there. So we definitely want you to encourage your students to utilize these resources that we're going to be showing you today. Okay, our most used LibGuides from last year, obviously, are uh, General Squires Library information, the hours, where are you located. Um, that had the most views with 10,000. Our DAL uh, student page, that's just for our distance students, they definitely take advantage of that because um, they're not here, so that really does help them a lot. But um, our next one there is our library instruction, and we will look at that. Um, that's something that Dee ha has set up with uh, maybe some of you here in class, where um, instead of bringing the class to the library to have a live library instruction, we have um, videos that cover the exact same information that they're able to watch on their own. And then um, they've set up a Google form so they can ask the questions that the teacher wants them 
to get from those videos to make sure that they're actually getting the information that they need. And so we have that for our English and biology and several other classes. And this is also the videos, even if you don't want to go through the whole thing of setting up a Google form, this is definitely something that you can use if you have a class that you have freshmen all the way to sophomore and, and seniors and juniors that you know or hope at least that your seniors are familiar with the library. This is somewhere that you could point your freshman students so that they can kind of get up to speed and be able to utilize the library resources. And then you can just see some other stuff there, more uh, subject specific. We have uh, the Music Resource Center, new resources in the library, our faculty resources page, which interestingly enough had 666 <laughs> views last year. What does that say about us? And um, no yeah, that's right. um, And then I'll also show you if you're not aware, if we have time, we do have all of the yearbooks, all of the, um, what are they called? Yes, the Vindaguas. Um, digitally, uh, it was a big uh, project that we worked on, and it's very interesting that you can go there and view all of our Vindaguas from way back. And that we had a we had a patron come in that had been here a long time ago, and we actually showed her this, and she was so excited she found herself, you know, on, online there, and it brought back so many memories. She was in tears there talking with us. So it is just a very interesting and very cool thing that we can offer our patrons and alumni. And then there's writing resources that helps them with their citation information, which is one of the huge questions that we get at the library. So we can definitely point our students there to help them. And our nursing uh, libguides, and I'll show you those, that um, our reference librarian, well, refer reference assistant Dawn, has set up, and they're really, really helpful for our nursing students. If you don't know how to get to them, on the library's homepage are subject guides right here. And we kind of use that interchangeably, libguides and subject guides. And let's see. Obviously, this is our most used page that has all of our information on it, telephone numbers, contact information. We can chat with the librarian here. You can always encourage your students to do that. Sometimes they're not comfortable calling on the phone, and they just want to, you know, in the, our day and age, they just want to type. So they can come and just chat right here, and this is available all the hours that the library is open, even, you know, late at night there. So uh, this is something that we definitely encourage them to do so that we can get in contact with them and, and help them. We <coughs> always have this posted, lots and lots and lots, how they can get the username and password, because this is by far our most often question how do how do you get that username and password so that's there for them also okay so let's look at some others here these are the library instruction um, pages that I was talking about you can see that we have these for several different uh, disciplines let's just go ahead and go to English and you can see we have several faculty members that have uh, this set up this also allows them to watch the videos on their own, fill out the Google form, and then they still come in for a library session, but this allows the students to actually go ahead and start researching with the help of a librarian being there so they can really get the hands-on experience. And when they have questions and they actually need us, then we're there to, to help answer those questions instead of just kind of talking to them. It they actually get to meet. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's been great. Wonderful. So this is definitely something that, that you can take advantage of. And like I said, if you don't want to go through all of that, you can still point your students here if they're having trouble. It tells them how to, you know, what, how do you determine the reliability, how do you cite something, why do we cite, and how do we search for resources. So there's lots of information here. Okay. the instruction calendar so if you need to book instruction the calendar is on this page and the little form that you need to fill out so you can sort of quickly glance and see if the room is being used or you know if you want to come over and use the room or if you need to come over and have an actual instruction and then you just fill out the form and submit it to us and we get back to you within about 48 hours so and that's on all of the instruction pages so regardless of the discipline it's one of the tabs on all of those pages And then we'll go ahead and take a look at the nursing um, pages. Oops, it's not coming up yet. And you can see we have the different disciplines. We'll go ahead and look at nursing because Don has done a wonderful job on these. 
and they just provide a lot of different kind of information for our students, not just necessarily um, library related information, but we also have different links where they can look at careers and different books that we have about careers. Uh, we have some different library resources and also web resources that we can provide to them there. And so um, this is something that we offer to the different disciplines. And for us, that is, as we are transitioning over to the new uh, LibGuides, that's going to be the main, one of the main reasons we really want to show this today, because we want to collaborate with you and get your input on, when we're just redesigning these, what do you think is the most important information that's going to be helpful for your students? so that we're not just creating what we think, but we're collaborating with you in that process to, to make it most relevant. And if you have a particular class where you feel like a study guide, a, a subject guide would be useful for that class, they have a big research project, they need like a research starter page, we'd be happy to create that. If that's something that would be most useful for you in your teaching, we'd be happy to put that together. And that's the next thing I wanna show you, some special topics that we've had in the past. Um, that we have created guides, and we just go ahead and leave those up for um, for use in the future. But this one is about Azusa Street, and then we also have uh, critical thinking and reasoning. I'm sure that that came about because of our last PEP. And so um, just have some reading resources and some different information there. So these are the kinds of things that we offer. And like Lewis was saying, these are the kinds of things that we would love to work together with you to format and to create so that they can be really useful for your students. And uh, we don't wanna just provide generic information that they can just Google because that's probably gonna be their first reaction if they wanna look something up is just to Google it. We wanna create something that's really gonna be useful and have a lot of useful information all together all at once for them so that they, that will be their first thought. Well, let's go to that guide and it's gonna have everything there that I need be a good starting point for them and so we would love to work together with you all to create those things do you have any questions <clears throat> okay was there something that today was somebody what was the thing that you looked at and thought this is what I like the most <laughs> oh wow <laughs> <laughs> to try and find just a part of the movie mm -hmm. just because like we've got the site content coming up mm -hmm. just trying to find pieces of the movie that portray it mm -hmm. you know it's we spent hours on there trying to find just that little that little piece so we can just sit there and put that out in the movie and myself just find one so when we try it for movie every time the students go over there does that count as another vhs yeah <coughs> absolutely well, but you know only if it's over it, only if the clip is over 30 seconds. Okay. So, I mean, if you put an entire, kind of like Sober Nursing, there are a number of clinical um, videos in there. But, you know, if you need those videos, if, if those are going to be helpful to your students, and, and just put them embed them in Moodle. And right now I'm going to YouTube and trying to find the most professional-looking right. video yeah. on YouTube. Well, of course, you know, that there's that other issue. You know, we talk a lot about um, our students and them going to Google or them going to Wikipedia, but us pulling their information off of YouTube is not really the best practice, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're going to be an e-campus, then we mm -hmm. have to think about what are best practices. So pulling content from something that we subscribe to through the library mm -hmm. is a is a is a best practice. Mm -hmm. It's something that we can model for our students of this is good scholarly content that came from your library, not from mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I don't get me wrong, I love YouTube. I spend yeah. plenty of time on YouTube. <laughs> but we do have we do have those the resources that you right. bought then we Absolutely. need to show the students how to do that yeah if you need to show them you need to show them and you know we, we do have a cap so eventually we'll run out of money say, from the guy who's in charge of the budget <laughs> let me just say it is a pilot for us so mm -hmm. we're we want to use it but we also want your feedback uh, when you if you're browsing in what do you think because uh, if we're going to go with something long term we want to make sure that that we're doing we're getting the best thing for the amount of money we're spending. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Oh, yeah. Should I be concerned that if I embed a video and half my class sees it and we reach the cap on the next half? Well, after we purchase it after four views over 30 seconds anyway. So.
So uh, you could show a whole video in your class, you know, once each semester, and that's we're that's we don't even take we don't buy that if it's just for two weeks. But uh, and one thing, this is not included in our discovery results. We intentionally have to do it. We we made sure that we didn't do that just so that students wouldn't see we could start <coughs> clicking on it. So. Uh, David, to answer your question, when we hit the the four views, the the fifth view um, instigates a purchase. So your video is then purchased for the year. So what it what it stops, what the cap will do is stop us from any additional purchases. So at that point, when we hit the four views on other items, those items we just kind of get locked out of. So once we hit the four, then there, that, that video, that documentary will sort of just be turned off until our fiscal year comes around again, and then they all get sort of turned back on. So yes. that's... The answer to your question <laughs> seems to be yes. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be that I could depend on a video, I could spend time setting it up, and then for it, for you the reach whole your cap, and it's not available. Your video would be purchased instantly, until until we run out of money, the next video would not be purchased because we'd already hit the cap. But your video would be uh, accessible for the entire year because we'd already <coughs> purchased it. So the purchases are instant. Uh, yeah, it's the next video that would get capped. So. I'm sorry to say that we have to take the yeah. uh, fire drill fund out of <laughs> 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 the next session.